Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Rich Frevert, the Executive Director of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony, and I'm really happy to welcome you all today to uh, the next episode of the Richer Experience. Uh, you know, we've taken a kind of a journey in our previous episodes of the Richer Experience, taking a look behind the scenes at, at what happens to make Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony concerts happen, and uh, we've been really excited to tour backstage to, to look at this wonderful facility at Gallagher Blue Dorn that we're sitting in right now, talking with some music musicians, and it's just been a great way to, to look and to just give you a little insight about how things happen with the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. We're going to continue that theme today, talking about behind the scenes, but we're going to take a little different twist to it. You know, the everything that we do costs money to, to put on. Uh, our concerts uh, are expensive, um, particularly when we have large orchestras, and we could not put those on without the support of the community and the fine donors and uh, grant-making institutions throughout the community that really help us to not only operate artistically at a high level, but also financially at a high level. And so it was, it was just really appropriate that we take the first opportunity to talk about the financial side and our contributors by welcoming uh, Dee and Dave Vantaventer today. Uh, Dee and Dave have stepped forward this year and have provided us some, some funds that are really helping us put on all of our online activities, including the Richer Experience, but also live from the archive, our, our performances that we're putting on with small ensembles. And so we're just really, really grateful to, to Dee and Dave for, for helping us, longtime supporters of the symphony. And so we're just going to explore, talk with them a little bit today about their experience with the symphony and uh, talk just a little bit about the, about the community support and how important it is to, uh, to provide it for the, for the orchestra and also for, not just for the orchestra, but for nonprofits in our community. So with that, I'm going to, uh, Dee, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've been uh, involved in fundraising for a long time, both as a, as a donor and also as a professional. And so I just would like to ask you your views and some of your observations about how important contributions and philanthropic support is to the nonprofits in our community. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, when I would do some presentations around the globe, one of the things I would have my audience do is, is ask them to shut their eyes for a moment and then think about the landscape of their community. And once they had that in their heads, then I would ask them, now start plucking out all the things that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the generosity of donors or the courage and conviction of volunteers to do the asking. I think the landscape would look pretty barren. And you can do that with programming too. And as you uh, think about here in the Cedar Valley, I mean, we're sitting in a place that wouldn't have happened without philanthropy. And so I think that it's important to reflect on nonprofits, the contribution that they make to our community not only from a building or program standpoint, but from an economic standpoint with all the people that are employed, all the people who are employed by nonprofits who are out spending, buying homes, doing mm -hmm. this and that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's something that's often overlooked about the, the, the arts in general, is about how much activity it brings to the community and the economic impact that, that the arts organizations do have. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Dave, I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a question here. Just uh, uh, just uh, talk a little bit about uh, kind of your observations about supporting the community, and then also I would really like to know between the two of you, do you ever have any kind of disagreement about what you're going to support in the community, and how how do those decisions get made? I know how they get made at my house, which is uh, sometimes not always the most scientific, but um, so maybe Dave, just tell a little bit about yourself, and then um, swing into that question. Well, I, uh, having married Dee, I'm sort of forced into philanthropy and community service, but I've been a mentor in the Waterloo schools for 20 years, and so even though... Um, we sometimes disagree. 
we really strongly support each other's passions. Mm -hmm. And some of that's, that's common. We're, we're both lifetime members of Girl Scouts. I know it's hard to believe I am, but I was president of the council. We're both alums of Iowa State University. We both appreciate music. I really like Dee's playlist better than mine <laughs> would ever be put together. <clears throat> and so I think that support of each other's passions helps make those decisions. And if there's a disagreement, she usually wins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um, I'm, now I'm going to um, welcome our Pauline Barrett, Artistic Director for the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. Jason Weinberger has joined us this morning. Um, and many of you out there may not know that, that Jason has been with the orchestra now 20 years. So 20 years since he came to the, to the community. And uh, congratulations on that tenure and everything that you've accomplished here with the orchestra, which has just been a, a wonderful legacy. Uh, so the, the three of you guys I know have been friends for a long time. And um, so if maybe just maybe talk a little bit about that 20 year span since maybe you, you first got to know each other and what are some of your favorite memories from your friendship and from those years? Well, that's a great question and thanks for the introduction, Rich. And um, now I'm counting back, you know, I think, uh, I think my first concert here was actually just after 9-11. So I'm in, into my, I'm, I'm heading into my 20th season of being involved here and that's just an incredible, um, incredible thing to, to reflect on and also to, 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 to really look back over that time and think about all these different experiences that I've been fortunate to have with the orchestra and with everybody who's around the orchestra. And I think that that gets to the, the heart of what we're talking about. Um, you know, to, to many of us, um, particularly artists, um, you know, uh, your relationship with the audience uh, or with those who are around an institution that does performing arts, for example, can be a little abstract. I mean, we get on stage and it's dark in the concert hall. We don't mm -hmm. really get to see the faces of the people who are out there. And one of the most rewarding things about being involved in an organization like this is the ability to take those relationships and develop them around the activities of the organization in lots of different ways. Because volunteers, the activities that they're engaged in, are so central to our ability to function that it's inconceivable that you'd be the music director of an orchestra and not really get to know lots of volunteers and people around the organization. And that has been truly one of the most magnificent things about my time here has been the ability to get to know so many of these wonderful people so well, to admire their work in the community. I'll, I'll tell you, when, when someone's very involved with something like the symphony, odds are they're quite involved in many other ways in the community. So mm -hmm. you're not just very getting to so. know people who just happen to love music. You're getting to know people who really do have a deep concern and care for the community and they want to give back and often are in a position to be able to give back. And so, um, you know, I, I always tell people when you're a symphony conductor, you're very privileged because you walk into the community and you get to know some of the very best people there. Mm -hmm. You get to go into all the schools and see what's happening. You really get to understand the landscape of the community just the way that, that Dee described it. And so um, it's hard to, to pick a highlight out of all these years. Sure, um, sure. But one of the things I want to I wanna share is, is um, a series of projects that we've done here uh, featured the artwork of Gary Kelly, and this may be something we come back to, and, and, and Dave and Dee have, have been involved in all of these. Um, to watch that collaboration flower, not just as an artistic collaboration, but also as a community collaboration, because there's a whole group of individuals who have come around again and again to support those projects, to make them possible. To me, that's, that's just a wonderful highlight of our working relationship. And the fun thing is when we go over to an event around one of Gary's things, it's just like hanging out with the crowd, you know? Right, and, and right. Really get Close friends, yeah. Enjoy it. So, so to me, those, those have been some of the outstanding things about being in this position. And I'll tell you, they, they don't teach you any of this stuff at school. So, so it was uh, such a wonderful revelation to experience all of this as a young conductor coming here and, of course, over the years since I've been here. Yeah. And it's, you know, uh, sitting, hanging on the wall right behind us is, is a Gary Kelly work. So it's, it's appropriate that, that you brought that up. Um, and I think it's uh, the whole multimedia aspect of that has been so fascinating as, as I've come into this job over the last two years to, to see that all of that come together. Um, it's just, uh, it's part of the tapestry. You know, I mean, when I think of our community and all of the different kinds of nonprofits and uh, it's just a tapestry that makes the whole thing come together. 
and um, and as long as we work together and and uh, have a vision for what that community what what the community we, how we want it to look you know we all do our part and, and it all all works together so d how about you how about you with some well, memories after 20 years we have lots of favorite memories uh my first favorite memory was when you walked on stage when you were doing your first uh concert as a candidate that's what i was going to use oh i'm sorry <laughs> okay well we can both do it um and then we had the opportunity at the Hearst Center to talk. Now somehow as a younger board member, I was on the search committee for you. And we had our meeting after your concert. And I said, that's it, we're done, hire him. And of course protocol prevented us from doing that. And, we, and I had to sit on pins and needles the whole season until we had the opportunity to select you and you said yes, and so I guess in my heart that's one of my favorites. But one of the most touching moments I have of you, Jason, is you called. Our kids were over from Vietnam, and our granddaughter, who was itty bitty, I think, came, uh, came over to our house. Jason called and asked if he could bring the boys over, and, uh, and he brought the boys over, and he brought some of their favorite toys to share with Layla. Now, you know, this is a busy guy, and I, I was so touched by that, and that remains very special in my heart. You know, there's a wonderful ending to that story, too. I think about a year later, I got a call or email from Dee. She mentioned, hey, I got, I got the toys. You know, Layla's bigger now, and, you know, she, we're not going to see her again for another six months or a year here, so we probably won't need these toys. And I think I picked up a couple things. Mm -hmm. And at the time that we brought those over, we didn't have a third child yet. But then in the interim, um, after Layla was born, we ended up having our third. And so he got to play with some of those toys. They came all the way back around full <laughs> circle before we finally, you know, brought them to, yeah. uh, to another, another place that could, could make use of them. And it's those kinds of relationships and those kinds of things. You know, that's exactly what they don't teach you in music school that you're going to encounter when you become involved in a musical organization like the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. And it's, it's easily been the most rewarding aspect mm -hmm. of, of the work that I do. Yeah. yeah. Dave, shall we turn to you next? Well, I think the collaborations with the uh, artists, the multimedia things and the uh, music to movies are most memorable. One thing that might not be the most memorable but sticks in my memory is uh, uh, when you're an organization like this, you try all kinds of different things to uh, en encourage money raising. And I remember very distinctly serving coffee in winter coats in July at a bicycle ride. <laughs> Windy and cold, the coldest, Good old Iowa coldest weather. day ever in the history of Iowa in the summer, serving coffee in those poor orchestra people in the Jessup uh, Community Center shelter with uh, trying to not wear gloves and play music. It was just, and then we traveled around afterwards, but it was, that is a memory. It's like we try all kinds of things and, and uh, they were there you know, and they were participating and we had lots of volunteers and it was fun and, but boy, coldest day in Iowa <laughs> this summer. <laughs> you know, it came up just the other day in a conversation with some musicians because we've been talking about the need to prepare to do more outdoor concerts. And one of the things that came up was remember that incredibly cold day when we were all playing outside at different locations, uh, but maybe unwittingly we got a little extra preparation for what we have to deal with now that we can't do a ton of indoor concerts with audiences. Yeah. Right, right. And I should, uh, I should mention that um, for those of you that, that maybe don't know Jason quite as well, he's a, an avid biker. And not a Harley biker, but a but a bicycle biker, and um, so that was kind of the genesis of, of that that project. And, and, and uh, so are these guys too. I, I should yeah. say they're they're pretty serious bikers, especially this year. So and maybe we'll hear about that in a little bit. But. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, I want we've talked a little bit about the general community and support of nonprofits in, in the community, but now let's turn a little more specifically to the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. And I'll just ask you two guys uh, specifically. Why do you support the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony? Do you want to go first? Well, I got mostly involved because Dee was involved as a board member, and she had a greater love for symphonic music than I did. Um, but yet, in the back of my mind, I 
was in band and privilege to play in band, stage band, and orchestra in high school, so I'm familiar with it. But it's fun to go to the concert and then go home and for me to watch television and go to a movie, I'm really attuned to the music behind the scenery and how bland and boring it would be without the symphonic music that's part of everything we do. Mm -hmm. So that's helped me enjoy the symphony to a greater extent than ever before. Oh, that's wonderful. What did you play in band? Trombone. 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 Okay. Yeah. He still tries to play it every once in a while, but <laughs> his lips swell off. You can do, you can do the smears. <laughs> 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 oh. Uh, when I moved to this community in 1977, the symphony was playing in, was it Kirschenbach Auditorium over in West High? And it was the thing to do. And I remember a good, good friend of mine said, hey, let's go to the symphony. And of course, growing up in Chicagoland area and having a friend singing the lyric opera and blah, 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 I thought, yeah, right, okay. Well, I'll go, I have nothing else to do. So we got all dressed up, of course, back then. And uh, I sat there and Joe Ginta was the conductor and I was blown away. This sophisticated kid from Chicago who thought she knew so much more, I was blown away. And it's continued to be that. Uh, the fun thing is listening uh, to some of the music from the archives, yeah. all those pieces, mm -hmm. they're so fabulous. And so I became uh, enamored with the orchestra and as a volunteer in the community, one of the boards that I looked up to was the symphony board members. Mm -hmm. Lots of community leaders and this and that. So someday I aspired to have a seat there. Mm -hmm. And thank God I was able to do that. Yeah. And as board president. Yes. And uh, quite a, and a, just a wonderful voice and a force for the symphony over the yeah. last 10 years. Uh, We're and, and so more lucky than that. to have yeah. this in our community. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, for that insight. Um, so Jason, I'm gonna turn back to you for, for just a moment. Um, we talked a little bit about memories between the, the three of you, um, but if you had to pick out one high point of your tenure here, tell us a little bit about that and then how donors and volunteers made that happen and made it possible. Yeah, you know, this one is a surprise to myself, actually, when I was thinking about this question that um, you asked us, you know, to consider. Um, you know, of course, I thought, oh, well, like, you know, conducting some big Mahler symphony, you know, or, or working with Yo-Yo Ma. I mean, these are, these are like career highlights that, you know, many people only dream of doing in their lives. And, you know, so to be able to do these things has been surpassed, you know, my, my wildest hopes when I went into, into music as a career. But when I step back and think about my work here with the symphony, and also in the context of the conversation that we're having today, um, increasingly, the high point, it's not really a point, but there's, there's an identification to it, which is when we were able to secure the support to actually put a name on my position. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody out there who's, who's you know, listening to us has ever been in a, in a position where they've had that title sort of named mm -hmm. name by a donor or a yeah. supporter. But it's incredibly humbling and it also makes you feel unbelievably proud in, in what the organization does and what the community stands for. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a, also a, a really strong connection to that event among this group because it was during Dee's tenure as president of the board and, and, and going back to before that, uh, but really culminating in your tenure that we were able to um, secure that support for the music director chair here at the symphony, which has now been ongoing for a number of years. And Pauline's generosity um, in and of itself is just remarkable and feels to me like a high point. But the fact that we were able to do that as a team and that um, there's real buy-in from the organization to make that happen and we continue to really focus on it, uh, I'm gonna have to put that down as, as actually the high point of my entire time here, even though it's not one single point. Right. Um, and there were certainly ups and downs to get there, but, but achieving that to me is, is a tremendous goal. And it just fills me with a, a lot of pride in, in what we do here at the symphony. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, Pauline is such a wonderful example of, 
of lifelong giving to the to the orchestra uh, as an annual fund donor as a sponsor and then she remembered us in her estate and um, and so that giving and that legacy will continue into the future um, and that's you know we have so many examples of that in the history of the orchestra um, that um, just really helps us move forward um, and so do you were well, about I, to say something I know at, after working with Pauline over the years um, delightful person always said she got back more than what she gave and I, I firmly believe it and she lived to a wonderful mm -hmm. age of activity mostly right. but it just made sense Pauline loved the symphony. She loved you. And she loved what you did to continue her beloved Joe Junta's symphony. I mean, that, that, that was hard. We had a lot of in-betweens, but she felt really good. And so giving her that opportunity at the stage of her life, I think really, really pleased her. Mm -hmm. Really pleased That's wonderful. her. And you've been such a good steward of that too, Jason. Yeah, and it was, it was really a wonderful experience to work with Dee on that project and to get to know Pauline a little bit better before her passing. And there's, there's not a moment when I don't go on stage or out in front of a group of kids and think about the support that she provides for us to do that. Um, you know, she, she makes it possible for me to continue to be here in this role. And so that's mm -hmm. very humbling and uh, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that yeah. day we went to celebrate her birthday and you brought your clarinet. That we made no. a little music too. <laughs> right there, oh my goodness, right there the, smile on on her, it, the smile <laughs> on her face. She was, she was just delighted. That's wonderful. So, uh, Dean Dave, kind of the same question to you. Uh, what was, what's been the highlight of your relationship with the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony? And and just kind of on an ongoing basis, how does it affect your lives? Well, I think one thing that I'm proud of as we develop our generosity and our gift giving planning to, to be able to walk downstairs and our biggest gift at the time was to this building. Is that right? And to share Wonderful that building. with everybody, yeah. Yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah, and to make plans in our estate to provide for the symphony in hopefully a significant way that um, will leave our footprint much like... We have an estate? We do. <laughs> <laughs> right now we do, but who knows about tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it, it, to me it's a rare occasion when you have the privilege to have been so involved not only to help raise money for this place. When I was at UNI, this was one of my responsibilities. But then to see it built, to sit with Camille Hogan and pray that this was mm -hmm. going to be in a perfect acoustical right. hall, and it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that first note, kind of the tears that were running down our faces. And then to see it continue. So rarely do you have that opportunity to go full circle. And this truly is the home of of the symphony, without right. the symphony, and I know I can speak to this because I was there, this place would not have gotten built. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at Ed Gallagher, Ed and Kathy, right. long-term symphony supporters, Camille and Dennis, and all the people that gave to this building, realizing that, that all these pieces had to come together, because this was a dream for 20 years for the symphony. It, it really was, yeah. And having a president who realized that, Dean O'Curris, and said, well, I know you can raise the money to build it, but you can't raise the money to keep it going. We mm -hmm. can do that. Yeah. And then we can bring in the School of Music and theater. And it, it, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. Yeah, it was, and it was so visionary of yeah. all of those people to, because that had been, like you say, it had been many, many years that this mm -hmm. was talked about in the community, the locations and what it's going to look like and how it's going to be funded and everything. But, um, you know, people of vision, you know, like yourself, President Curris, um, the Gallaghers, um, you know, you, you could just, uh, when I was here the first time, there were meetings where this was being discussed, and you could just tell there was, there was an electricity there that it was going to happen. It may not happen tomorrow at that time. But it was going to happen. Yeah, and a coming together of communities. Waterloo, Cedar Falls, I think our economic development people point to this. 
as one of those linchpins that brought us together rather, and got rid of that dividing line. And, and you think about Ed, who was co-chair with Carl Bluedorn, Carl and Peggy. I don't remember Carl and Peggy being that much mm -hmm. symphony goers, but Ed and Carl had such a deep respect for each other that when Ed said, Let, yeah. let's put our names on this thing, let's, mm -hmm. let's step up, and yeah. Carl did it, and yeah. Peggy. Yeah. And it made it happen. Yeah. I have one more comment, Sure, too. go ahead, Dave. We can't forget that the music is excellent. I mean, I, we're talking about the archives, and Dee and I sit there, and we close our eyes, and we listen. And we go, well, is that the Chicago Symphony or the New York Philharmonic? It's the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. The music is fabulous. And the musicians are professional, and it's just excellent music to come and listen and to compare. And we do that on Friday nights. We, we hurry home to, <laughs> even though we can watch it again, we, we hurry home and say, oh, okay, let's, we got to listen to the archives. It's Friday. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the um, you know, wonderful things to, to use as a summation of this, which is really, there's so much that happens that I think uh, many folks who encounter the symphony may not be aware of that make it possible for this wonderful group of musicians to get together and play um, the way that they do. And this is a really unique ensemble. And I think that reflects the unique kind of web of support that we have for the organization here. Um, it, it takes a huge team to have a, a wonderful orchestra playing on stage. You know, it's not one person's, you know, huge Herculean effort. It, it's really the, the work of many, many different people. And I, I think, Dave, you know, talking with you about this is the perfect illustration of exactly that and how all that work comes together to make these wonderful artistic experiences that everybody in the community can enjoy. Well, you know, I think that is a wonderful thought to, uh, to end our conversation today. Uh, and um, for those of you out there that are interested in the, in the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony and becoming involved either as a volunteer or as a donor, uh, we need your support now more than ever in this, this time of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, so uh, there are several ways that you can become involved. As I said, you can, you can be involved as a volunteer. Uh, we have several committees on the board that welcome both board members and non-board members. Uh, we also have opportunities uh, sometimes in the office uh, with, with in connection with the concerts when we're back doing live concerts again. And then on the giving side, there, there are also several, several ways that you can participate. Uh, our annual fund happens every year, uh, and the gifts range from anywhere from $25, to $25 up to you know, $1,000 or dollars or more. Um, anywhere, wherever you fall in that range, we're, we're just so grateful for all of the people that support our annual fund. And we, all, we also have a special campaign going on this year called the Ready to Play campaign. And this is really coming out of the situation we find ourselves in with, with the pandemic. We're not able to do live concerts. Uh, we don't know exactly when those concerts are going to resume. We hope in the spring. Uh, but during this time that we're a little bit more quiet as far as live performances, uh, we really need our community to, to help us just get through this, this time uh, and to help us emerge e an even stronger organization. And one of the things that's been so exciting, and again, thank you again to Dee and Dave for their vision and helping us with our online programming, is that there are so many ways that, that we have adapted that we feel like are going to be really permanent parts of our organization, including several of the things that we've been doing online. And so any way that, that, that the community can support us in that, we just want to come out and just be really uh, stronger at the end of the pandemic and just come out with a bang when we, when we get back on the stage and uh, start making music because uh, uh, we have some, some great ideas and, and we're certainly going to have a lot of enthusiasm when we get back on the stage. So I want to thank all three of you for, for joining us today. And any other comments that you have as we wrap up? I do. One more. I, I want to say how fortunate we are in this community to have this dynamic duo. Jason and his talents and passion, and Rich, his, his skills and experience and ideas, um, also a musician. So we're very fortunate, and the creativity that you all have come up with, uh, in spite of the pandemic, we're getting through it, 
and it and it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dee. Thank you. So, with that, everyone have a great day, and thank you for joining us.